Good afternoon, good evening, good morning to all of you. My name is Thomas Kessler from the Financial Sector Group at the Asian Development Bank. I will be leading you through the next 90 minutes together with my colleagues and our distinguished guest speakers. I would like to invite you to write your questions in the chat box as we move through the program and we will pick them up at the end of the session. It's my great pleasure now to introduce Susan Gabory from the Asian Development Bank. She is the Director General for Private Sector Operation, which provides direct assistance to private sector projects with clear development impact. She will now deliver the welcome remarks. Many thanks and over to you, Susan. Thank you, Thomas. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, distinguished audience and guest speakers. It's my uh, great pleasure to be with you today and to welcome you to the launch of the SME Blue Impact Asia, a platform financing the small and medium enterprises that dominate the blue economy in Asia and the Pacific. This spotlight session is part of ADB's first Healthy Oceans Tech and Finance Forum, which aims to share innovative technologies good practices, case studies, and practical solutions to pro protect and enhance the health and the resilience of ocean ecosystems and coastal communities in the region. Let me start by reiterating the importance of healthy oceans to global prosperity. The oceans supply some 70% of the oxygen we breathe and its health is critical to climate mitigation and adaptation. Some coastal habitats can hold up to four times more carbon than tropical rainforests. Since the 1970s, 93% of the additional global warming has been absorbed by the ocean, a huge number. The ocean also offers massive potential for marine renewable energy, such as floating solar and offshore wind. Ocean health is also critical to biodiversity. The Asia Pacific Coral Triangle alone has more coral species than anywhere else on the earth. Billions of people rely on oceans for food, excuse me, for food and for livelihoods. But our oceans are under serious threat. Half of all marine species, corals and mangroves have already been lost. 8 million tons of plastic enter our oceans every year. Average global temperatures are expected to rise above 1.5 degrees Celsius with further detrimental consequences for the oceans and the coastal environments. We need to act now. We have the tools and it's not too late, but we must act public and private sector together. Small and medium enterprises have a critical role to play in restoring ocean health as they represent 70% of employment and 90% of total enterprises in developing countries across all sectors of the blue economy. This spotlight session presents an innovative platform, SME Blue Impact Asia, that focuses on small and medium enterprises, helping them access finance in support of ocean's health. The objective is to identify and develop bankable blue economy projects that are co-financed by private sector capital with a range of blended finance instruments, thereby improving the amount and efficacy of capital uh, and efficiency of a cap a financial capital for oceans. A pilot is being launched in a cooperation with UNEP and UNDP to test the platform across Asia and the Pacific. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our partners, UNEP and UNDP for their strong commitment and support on this initiative. <clears throat> Today, we will also hear from the European Commission who have successfully launched a similar platform, Blue Invest Europe, and we will integrate their experience considering the regional and local context in Asia. We will also have distinguished representatives from the private sector outlining potential bankable SME projects and from interested investors from which we are keen to hear their perspectives on this initiative. SME Blue Impact Asia is part of ADB's commitment to ocean and climate health. The Asian Development Bank joined global efforts to protect the ocean by launching the action plan for healthy oceans 
and sustainable blue economies at ADB's annual meeting in 2019 in Fiji. The action plan includes a commitment to scale up ADB's investments and typical, uh, technical assistance, including co-financing, up to $5 billion US dollars by 2024. ADB is also committed to full alignment with Paris Agreement and has elevated its ambition to deliver climate financing to its development member countries to 500, or excuse me, $100 billion from 2019 to 2023. Sorry, 2030, I'm getting my numbers mixed up. In Glasgow last year, we had a strong representation led by our president, and mobilized nearly $1 billion in commitments to the various climate change initiatives that support Article 6, from promotion of uh, carbon markets to community resilience initiatives. As a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, ADB's private sector operations has to date committed over $5 billion through its programs to support trade and supply chain finance, as well as microfinance over uh, $600 million through private uh, sector financing. ADB's private sector operations is keen to support SME Blue Impact Asia and to contribute to the immense opportunity to address the challenges and opportunities related to healthy oceans together with our private sector partners. I look forward to a fruitful webinar and thank you very much for all your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan, and uh, we greatly look forward indeed to uh, working closely together with private sector operation on this initiative. I'm now delighted to announce the keynote speech of Peter Thompson, UN Secretary General, Special Envoy for the Ocean. As he unfortunately was not able to make it live, we will now listen to his video message. Ladies and gentlemen, all courtesies observed. And many thanks to UNDP and UNEP for giving me the privilege of addressing you all today. I'll present my remarks on investment in the sustainable blue economy today from the perspective of the UN's Sustainable Development Goal 14, known as SDG 14, our universal goal to conserve and sustainably use the ocean's resources. As we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, it is crucial that we dedicate efforts on a global scale in defense of a healthy ocean. You may have heard my daily mantra, there can be no healthy planet without a healthy ocean, and the ocean's health has been measurably in decline for some time now. I won't go into the details of that decline in my remarks today, but in case you're not fully aware, we, and I mean all of us, have been party to driving that decline of the ocean's health. Thus, it would be disingenuous were I to ignore it entirely on what I have to say today. We need every tool at our disposal to affect positive change, and finance is a powerful one. The Sustainable Blue Economy Finance Principles, hosted by UNEP FI, has produced guidance for financiers to speed and uh, the transition to sustainable maritime industries by directing capital away from destructive practices and towards restorative ones. Nature-based solutions are a critical element in building the resilience of ecosystems and societies and economies to respond to climate change, estimated as having the capacity to provide a third of our mitigation needs. Since financing for nature-based solution, rem solutions remains a comparatively low, we are called upon to urgently change the paradigm by accounting the value of blue natural assets identifying investment needs and providing the necessary incentives, investment mechanisms and finance. Ladies and gentlemen, many small businesses are engaged in protecting ocean resources because their lives literally depend on them. Fisheries, mangroves, coral reefs and the vast ocean itself provides economic functions that are too numerous to list yet are well understood by coastal communities well, worldwide. Therefore, dedicated platforms to identify and finance and support and scale up those sustainable blue economy businesses are a global imperative. We are here today to consider one such platform, the mission of the Blue Impact Platform, 
launched today by the ADB in cooperation with UNEP and UNDP is to finance and engage with small and medium enterprises, in other words, SMEs, with less than $10 million revenues that have a positive impact on the ocean's health and the communities that depend on them. In reality, there is no shortage of capital, nor of projects. There is, however, a yawning gap between the two and an urgent need for matchmaking and de-risking between the two, especially for smaller but impactful enterprises. I applaud the ADB's Healthy Ocean Action Plan and the variety of initiatives, initiatives that it has spurred, including the Blue Impact Platform for Asian SMEs. Most ocean-oriented finance has been directed at large-scale sovereign and infrastructure projects, which are certainly an important part of the solutions we seek. Likewise, public-private finance initiatives have made substantial, uh, substantial progress in areas such as natural capital restoration, sustainable seafoods, green ports, and uh, the greening of shipping. However, around the world, SMEs are the missing middle of sustainable finance, including, may I say, for the implementation of SDG 14 to conserve and sustainably use the ocean's resources. These are the enterprises on the front lines of community engagement for ocean health. According to the World Bank, SMEs represent 90% of all enterprises, 70% of jobs, and the highest personal stakes in protecting marine ecosystems. Yet most banks and private funds deem SMEs as too small or risky to invest in, and SMEs remain under the radar of most large projects. That is why, ladies and gentlemen, a systematic approach to financing the blue economy SMEs is so timely. Benefiting from models like the EU's Blue Invest program in aggregating and de-risking SMEs into bankable portfolios, capital markets can thereby be brought into a rightful role of supporting these primary actors in the sustainable blue economy. Most financial actors are fiduciaries who can only invest in assets that meet their risk return criteria, no matter how much they may sympathize with the SDGs and are struggling planetary ecosystems. It's thus that the use of the digital tools and blended finance proposed by Blue Impact presents a practical way to guide private investment in ocean health. And let us remember that UNDP has advised that private capital markets are the principal source, some 90%, to meet annual SDG financing needs. I therefore applaud this initiative and the consortium of the ADB, UNDP and UNEP that is driving it forward. I look forward to hearing about the first fruits of the SME Blue Impact Platform when we convene at the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon from 27th June to 1st of July this year. Who can doubt that the small and medium enterprises on the front lines of the battle to stop the decline in the ocean's health deserve the capital and tools needed to overcome? Good wishes in this endeavor and thank you for your attention today. Well, we would like to thank you and Ambassador Thompson for this truly inspiring speech. There's no doubt that there is a need for urgent actions, which motivates us even more to successfully implement SME Blue Impact Asia. But what is and how does it work, uh, SME Blue Impact Asia? I would like to invite Michael Adams to present the concept of this SME Blue Impact Asia. Michael is our consultant under a ADB UN. UNEP, UNDP jointly funded technical assistance with the mandate to support us in developing a knowledge product uh, financing the blue economy. He is the founder and CEO of Ocean Assets Institute, established in 2015, leveraging his 35 year career in finance, the transition to sustainable uh, marine uh, activities. He also consulted the European Commission for the setup of Blue Invest Europe, about which we will hear more later also. Without further ado, Michael, the floor is yours to introduce the concept of SME Blue Impact Asia. Thank you. 
Thank you, Thomas and Peter and Suzanne. What an excellent background. You saved me some time <laughs> because the context is now very clear. Uh, we have been working for almost uh, two years with ADB, UNEP and UNDP, such a strong consortium to understand what is needed to uh, speed up the transition to sustainability across Asia's blue economy. And uh, we concluded uh, that there's a $5.5 trillion total gap to finance uh, sustainability in the blue economy across some 29 countries that touch on the oceans. Almost half of that can be attributed to the needs of SMEs. And as Peter has uh, clearly said, they, uh, they dominate the economies of all these countries, the jobs, and they're on the front lines of both climate and ocean uh, ecosystems that we need to protect. Um, <clears throat> so. How do we do that? Because on the other side, investors uh, do want to have access to uh, small and medium enterprises. That's where a lot of the growth is. And yet they're very fragmented markets. So the uh, plan that we have proposed and are now underway doing is a, to use digital technology to make it more efficient to both identify and prepare um, SMEs across the region, <clears throat> excuse me, for uh, investment readiness so that they can be matched with uh, appropriate qualified investors. And um, we can facilitate the closing of transactions, both individual ones and uh, grouped in vehicles that may have some blended finance elements. Uh, so we're really working with three qualities here, digital finance tools, um, blended finance tools, and an ex very experienced team. The, the background of our team, uh, for instance, is almost entirely in raising capital for small companies and funds, as well as risk management. Uh, so what are we talking about when we say SMEs, by the way, because it is different in the developed versus developing world. And we're talking about uh, capital raises of under 10 million or revenues of under $10 million. And that goes all the way down to micro enterprises that may have just a couple hundred thousand dollars of revenue. Um, <clears throat> this covers all blue economy sectors and all stages from early stage to uh, long-standing businesses that are very essential for the ocean health and community health across the region. Uh, this is modeled after the Blue Invest platform. I was involved in uh, designing and launching that in 2018. We'll be um, very uh, honored to have the director of the program uh, speaking here in a minute. Um, and so that is a model that we use and adapt to the different realities of the developing countries across the region. The governance structure in a simple shot means there's a servicing arm and an investment arm. Uh, this platform is designed to be self-sustaining uh, after year three, we expect by sharing uh, a fee uh, for successful placements. Uh, that is a difference between this and the Blue Invest Europe uh, platform. It's important that we be self-sustaining as well as the um, companies that we are uh, helping on this path. What are the choices for SMEs today? Here's a, a complicated uh, chart, but the top three are the ones we will most be working with. Um, of course, at the very top is the uh, electronic platforms, <clears throat> which includes an information service, which really is essentially what we're proposing here under Blue Impact. It's not a transaction platform but it is a community, it's an information service that speeds up the, um, the investment readiness and the matching with investors. Crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending programs though have been very good innovations for this whole uh, smaller company sector around the world. Uh, private equity and debt funds are also very important and play a big role, uh, but they need to some aggregation and de-risking often. And that's also true of impact loans. That's such a good invention of the sustainable finance movement that we expect to uh, encourage on the platform as well. Uh, so a lot of the other choices there may not be realistic <clears throat> for many of the developing um, companies in developing countries across the region. But this is the array of, of ideal choices, yet really it's the top few that are practical and still this whole aggregation uh, platform is needed to get a lot of companies to participate in them. The metrics that uh, we will follow include social and environmental metrics. As we did the Blue Economy Knowledge product, we looked at eight questions for each uh, sector of the Blue Economy. And the last two are the ones that were really activating on the Blue Impact platform. Is it an opportunity for SMEs? And what is the capacity to attract private investment? Some sectors are 
uh, better on those questions than others, but they all are worthy and will uh, uh, be given attention. Some of the key performance indicators we expect to achieve by 2030 are there listed. And uh, yes, we would like to cross a billion dollars of capital deployed with the help of private investors and over 200 uh, SMEs involved in the program. That's not off track with what Blue Invest Europe has achieved. Um, and then we did a call for applications uh, last year across the region and came up with four winners uh, from these different sectors to the seaweed uh, farming and commercial infrastructure uh, activities of a combined uh, offering, which we're gonna hear about in a minute, and uh, marine ecosystems, how to make them bankable, and a seafood processing plant um, that uh, all of them have very strong impact values and uh, range in capital raising from $3 million to $9 million. And so that gives us a, a fair view of what's possible, the exciting opportunities there for private investors um, that will be activating in this platform. Uh, lastly, I'm very pleased to introduce Kathleen O'Leary, who has been helping us um, design the platform uh, from the digital uh, features. And we chose DeLeo Group as the best in class in this whole area of technology for private capital markets. Um, they're able to meet the needs of both private investors and the companies, as well as customize the features because we have uh, demands that are somewhat unique with impact uh, um, metrics um, and uh, a very customer driven approach, which you'll see as uh, Kathleen walks us through the model of how this works. They've done this for over 90 financial institutions digitizing their entire investment process and interaction with clients. And that includes the impact and emerging market world in which we are now marching forward on this mission. Thank you all for being here and for helping. And Kathleen, please give us a walk through how the platform will work. Michael, I need you to and share your slides so I can share mine. How's that? Does that work? Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to join this. We're very excited to be a part of this project. Um, yes, as Michael said, we are very passionate about uh, providing democratized access to private investments. We work with lots of financial institutions and we've developed a tool that we believe um, uh, serves two main purposes uh, in this application. Uh, one, it will be to provide curated access to SME projects um, that in, and we are going to focus on the investor experience. And we know that that's one of the challenges in, in this supply demand mismatch that we heard spoken about earlier. Um, so we know that uh, making sure that the, the digital process uh, for investors to engage is seamless and uh, user-friendly. And that's one of the main uh, things that we'll, we'll accomplish with this uh, platform. The other thing, um, as, as Michael mentioned, uh, Blue Impact is going to provide investment readiness and advisory services for SMEs. So again, what this, what this digital platform will do is provide for those, you know, a, a place for both SMEs and investors uh, to get the service and digital experience that they expect at this point. Um, I'm going to run through just very quickly a couple of slides uh, that show some of the functionality you all will hopefully one day uh, enjoy in this platform. So uh, quickly, I'll say, first of all, one of the challenges we have, we know in, in private investments is uh, managing the origination process, finding the right deals. And so what this platform will allow Blue Impact to do is standardize and streamline that origination process. Um, there's an integrated data room, so you'll be able to, both investors and SMEs will be able to um, manage uh, documentation in, a, in the secure portal. Um, uh, as part of that investment readiness and coaching services, uh, you'll be able to provide a lot of feedback and SMEs will be able to use that and gain insights. Investors will be able to ask questions. All of that will be stored where the platform owners can manage it. it it's, a, it's a really nice uh, way for providing feedback and, and, and increasing uh, dialogue. Um, 
The platform has an integrated matching engine, so we'll make sure that investors see the types of deals they want to see. Uh, preferences are is really important. Uh, so that's one part of the, the platform. And then um, there's great uh, analytics within the platform that will allow uh, reporting and performance tracking against some of the KPIs Michael mentioned earlier. So that's a quick whistle stop tour of the platform. And uh, we we really believe this will be a successful, um, successful part of your offering. So uh, any questions at the end? Well, thank you very much, um, Michael and Kathy. Your presentation made the concept of the platform quite clear and, and also illustrates the, the power of technology to be leveraged. Uh, now, obviously, while we will be implementing uh, these pilots, there will be lots of questions and issues to be addressed. And we will now have for the rest of this session various inputs from different perspectives through a dialogue with potential partners and panelists that will help us ensure the, the success. Let me start by inviting Radhi Kalal, who is the SDG Finance Policy Advisor and Team Lead at UNDP's Bangkok Regional Hub. So let me ask you, Radhika, basically, why are UNDP and UNEP supportive of this initiative and how, how does this fit in UNDP's and UNEP's uh, programs? Thanks very much, uh, Thomas. Um, uh, before I um, respond to your question, just let me offer um, deep appreciation really for, you know, for, for this collaboration and for this very, very practical um, approach. And I think that's what really excites us, that it addresses the missing middle, but in a very practical way and also allows us to see really how um, it fits in with our programs. So uh, talking a little bit both about UNDP um, as well as UNEP, the, the two UN partners here. For UNDP, um, which has long had a focus on ocean governance, very much like uh, ADB and, um, and UNEP, um, more recently, there's been um, a feeling that we needed to, to tackle uh, the missing middle, to, to look at not just uh, ocean governance and SDG 14, but really the intersection with SDG 1, 2, um, and a number of the others, um, so that the governance of the ocean really works as much for, for people um, as well as the economy. Um, and most of our work um, is at country level. So we look at another aspect of scaling uh, this initiative, which is embedding it within government programs and understanding of this important space, how to, to bring financing, the public role um, in bringing private financing to this space. Um, and that's a key um, area in addition to the, the joint uh, work that we'll be looking at. Uh, for UNEP, and uh, my colleague Jonathan can speak much more about this, um, a very strong engagement on the on the finance side, especially UNEP FI. Uh, UNEP FI works with more uh, more than four hundred and fifty banks, insurers, investors, uh, and supports over a hundred um, supporting institutions to help create uh, the financial sector, the the sort of the other side of this, the the people who who will engage in interacting with them. Um, and curating and hosting the principles for responsible banking, principles for responsible investment, and most recently, uh, the sustainable blue financing principles. And bringing all of that together is really the PEA initiative, the, the Poverty Environment Action, uh, that brings these different elements together and really informs the, the work of, the, um, of financing for the missing middle including through looking at sustainability standards, lessons, and other things. So uh, let me stop here um, in terms of, of that, but you'll see that it really is a multifaceted uh, type of engagement that allows us in turn to bring in different parts um, of our institutions uh, together in, in this joint initiative. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Vadika. I think uh, you know this is a, a good example, this initiative uh, to show how international organizations like ours uh, work together and leverage resources, expertise, and, uh, and and convening power, which is important. So I, I will let you go since I know you have another meeting and it's mid in the the night and uh, you still have a train to or a plane to catch to come back to the region. Uh, but as you said, Jonathan Gilman from from Unit is joining later the, the discussion. So thank you very much. Radhika. Thank you. Um, now we have al already several times heard about Blue Invest Europe, which was launched only recently and is supervised and funded by the European Commission through the European Investment Fund. We would like to, to play a short video sent by Andrea Strachinescu, head of Unit Maritime Innovation, Marine Knowledge and Investment at the European Commission. Through her statement, we will get some more insights in this highly successful initiative. So please uh, launch the video. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and pleasure to speak at the launch of the Blue Impact Asia platform for Ocean SME Finance, sponsored by the Asian Development Bank and the United Nations. We know that the ocean is home to a vibrant blue economy industry, which is set to grow not only in Europe, but in the whole world. We have emerging innovative blue economy sectors, such as ocean renewable energy, blue biotechnology and algae production, which are adding new markets and creating new jobs. In European Union with the European Green Deal, the level of ambition was set up high because the Europe committed to cut its greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030, leading to net zero by 2050. We believe that a sustainable blue economy is essential to achieve the Green Deal objectives because it promotes ocean conservation, it promotes sustainable use of marine resources, in the same time creating jobs and wealth. This is why the European Commission has adopted last year a communication which outlines the new sustainable blue economy strategy. In order to meet the decarbonization, the biodiversity and the zero pollution objectives of the European Green Deal, it is for sure that we'll need big investments and many innovation. And this they need to happen in the blue economy as well. And now the conclusion, we set up, of course, the Blue Invest platform in, or in Europe in order to support the SMEs and the startups because they are at the heart of innovation. Innovation is happening at the level of the big companies, but we know that the most agile ones are the SMEs and the startups. It makes us proud to see that the Blue Invest is now seen as a reference not only in European Union, but also on international level. We provided coaching to entrepreneurs whose business skills sometimes they do not match their technical skills. And we supported SMEs to access private capital to finance their innovation. Like this, we created a whole ecosystem in order to support the SMEs and the startups through various financial instruments to close the finance gap and to arrive with their innovation onto the market. We believe that the power of innovation combined match with the power of mobilizing private investment for sustainable impact is the way forward for a healthy ocean and sustainable development. We therefore wish you good sailing and lots of success with your Blue Impact Asia platform. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Eugene Wong, the CEO of the Sustainable Finance Institute Asia, or SOFIA as we are more commonly known. I'm delighted to have been invited to share with you my thoughts today. SOFIA is a neutral and independent nonprofit organization that seeks to catalyze ideas on sustainable finance in ASEAN at the policy level and to propel action in support of those ideas. We provide a neutral venue for governments, the private sector, academia, and CSOs to come together to identify issues, share ideas, and develop solutions. As part of our contributions in the ASEAN Sustainable Finance Agenda, we host the ASEAN Taxonomy Board and convene the ASEAN Capital Market Policymakers Industry Advisory Panel. We all know that the oceans and seas are not just a resource, but a part of the way of life for many in the Asia Pacific. But never before in history have the oceans and seas been in more danger, under attack simultaneously by climate change, pollution, and economic exploitation. The blue economy contributes significantly to the Asia Pacific GDP. Of the total population employed in the fishing sector globally, some 85% is in Asia. 
In October last year, the ASEAN leaders issued a declaration on the blue economy, recognizing that the ocean and seas are key drivers of economic growth and innovation. In Southeast Asia, the finance policymakers have incorporated the blue agenda into their efforts to promote sustainable finance. The ASEAN Capital Markets Forum and its roadmap for ASEAN Sustainable Capital Markets and the ASEAN Working Committee on Capital Market Development in its report on promoting sustainable finance in ASEAN have developed recommendations that will help spur and support blue finance. As part of these recommendations, the ASEAN Capital Markets Forum, with the support of ADB, launched an SDG bond toolkit last month to help issuers issue bonds that address specific SDGs, including SDG 14, Life Below Water. Another particularly interesting recommendation is the use of technology, such as through crowdfunding. We have to remember that small and medium-sized enterprises, who are the backbone of the ASEAN economy, make up more than 90% of businesses, 69% of employment, and 41% of the GDP in ASEAN. Even before COVID, private sector finance was key to supporting the blue economy. Now that COVID has strained government finances, private sector finance is even more critical. Getting funds to these SMEs is not an easy affair owing to a variety of factors, including the small size of the funding, credit criteria, and the data available. The use of technology is particularly potent as solutions that could not be deployed in the past can now be effectively and economically offered. The ASEAN Working Committee on Capital Market Development, in its report that I mentioned earlier, highlights the potential use of crowdfunding platforms where SDG-related projects from across the region can be hosted. A centralized platform hosting projects that have been filtered in some way provides credibility and efficiency that we've not been able to see before. The Blue Impact concept answers this call, and this is why Sophia has been very keen in developing the Blue Impact concept, whether as a partner or as a facilitator. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for these two videos. Actually, one was played a little bit early, just the last one, which we where we heard Eugene Wan, the, the chief executive officer of the Sustainable Finance Institute um, in Asia, as he said, also called uh, Sophia. Um, this is an independent think bank bringing together representative of governments, regulators, central banks, multilateral development banks, private uh, sector industry, uh, most importantly, but also academia and non-governmental organization. And they provide unbiased and um, credible policy recommendation and implementation uh, support to countries in the region, particularly um, to the Asian countries. So, um, uh, yeah, we thank uh, Eugene for, for this encouraging work and, and ADB is already closely working with uh, Sophia on topics related to the Asian uh, capital market. Um, uh, and um, we certainly have the opportunity to, to, work, uh, to work more to, together. Um, I just wanted also to thank um, uh, Andrea for her um, kind words from the European Commission. And I just wanted also to add that we um, um, really have to congratulate um, for, for their initiative. The Blue Investor Europe um, is also uh, operating on a digital platform. And since it has, has launched only recently, there is already more than, than 1,000 um, members on their platform. They have 3 million euros mobilized and, and allocated to five different fund managers. And um, uh, 170 um, SMEs got development support, which uh, has led them to increase um, uh, their job for, uh, up to 12%. Now, um, to get forward in the program. Um, oh, Mr. Perfection, there are 300 million euros mobilized by <laughs> the platform so far. Oh, now. sorry. I mixed up the figures as well. Thanks for, for, for intervening. Um, so now, basically, um, we would like to, to move on with, with one cash question that is um, often brought forward, uh, namely, to what extent and to what scale will investors be ready to take on board SME finance and investment risks? And for this, I would like to now invite John Fulton, who is adjunct professor at the Geneva Business School and at the Schiller International University in Madrid. 
teaching international business. She has more than 25 years in international banking and uh, finance experience especially in financial risk management. So she will now provide us with some consideration on de-risking portfolios of SMEs. The floor is yours, uh, John. Hello, uh, everyone. And thank you, Thomas, for that introduction. And thank you to all the organizers for inviting me here today to participate in this uh, forum. It's a very exciting and critical topic for the world. Um, so as Thomas mentioned, I'm a professor of international business and a former banker. Credit risk is my focus, uh, but with also 15 years uh, working with NGOs in Southeast Asia. And so this is very close to my personal interests as well. But I would like to make a few points from my perspective, uh, academic and risk and practical business regarding the Blue Impact Platform. As we know in any organization, balancing the interest of all stakeholders is challenging and often in conflict. That's rule number one. Uh, so priorities must be set. For blue economic development, the interests of the macro world of international agreements combined with regional and local laws and practices must work together with commercial interests. And so those SDGs are an excellent guideline to help commercial interests align their priorities with macro forces, along with certifi certifications, which all together enhance the blue economy, right? So the Blue Impact Platform is a key player in this process because it provides information in a transparent, consistent, and timely role or manner. So in order to bring these commercial and macro interests together, enterprises uh, and must manage business risks, obviously, and sustainability criteria. This is the extra plus to meet the appetites of investors to fulfill the needs of the blue SMEs. Therefore, I'd like to talk about uh, five roles um, uh, that the platform like Blue Impact and its participants, both on the SME side and on the investing side, are to help the existing uh, Blue MEs, SMEs scale up in an efficient and effective manner to exponentially scale up progress of the Blue economy, because that is the end goal. Uh, but it has to be done in a economically viable manner. So in the first role, uh, is working with the pipeline partners, and that is that can be many, many sources, such as private equity, industry groups, governments, local finance. And then they have to be first screened uh, because they have an objective too. They can't do everything. So they want co-financing. They're looking for job growth, economic growth, ecosystem protection, community support, they don't want to feel alone. Being part of a community is one of the key factors and international networks. And so that is one key role is to help streamline the pipeline, partners help them in their work as well. So the second role is to de-risk the monitoring and verification. Um, so we depend very much on the work of the pipeline partners to verify all of the ground uh, information. But uh, we also then have to screen it and make sure it's in a format that works for the investors and is in a consistent format so that it is very timely. Um, with that information, there can be then uh, the investors can conduct their own due diligence in addition to what is given to them, but a big chunk of the work is done ahead of time. But then again, there is ongoing monitoring. It's just not a one-stop shop. Uh, the idea is a community is built and that continuous flow of information is shared with the platform so that the community is kept informed, best in class, good examples uh, is developed. So a third role then would be to actually de-risk the assets. Now, risk has many, many aspects. I won't go into all the details. And we know that every country has its own issues. Every industry has its own problems. 
And then we have to also keep on top of that all the sustainability metrics, the blue metrics, the green metrics, uh, to meet the um, investor blue objectives. So the blue team, blue impact team, uh, is to help assess the areas for improvement and to initially help them get ready to meet what would be kind of like a more regional or international standard because you're competing globally for this money. So you really have to have a global standard. Um, so, but there's an important point here that SMEs register on the platform to engage in this process, but they are not visible to investors until a minimum score is achieved. Uh, so it's eligibility and quality. So there's a screening process. It's not a decision process, but it's to kind of get them up to that uh, global standard. And so the fourth role is then the actual readiness. Once they've reached that level to help give them ideas on their business side, on the sustainability side, because the point is not just to get on the platform and to get the investor is to grow the business and to be a best in class for other people as well. And so the platform will provide direct advisory recommendations um, from the Blue uh, Impact team the knowledge platform, which will depend very much on standards, guidelines, uh, and existing metrics. The point is not to reinvent the wheel. The point is to streamline the wheel. And then the community will provide the expertise, the ex, uh, consulting mentorship that is needed for that sector, for that company, for that country. Um, and therefore, the approval would be given and then the SMEs would be open to investors depending on their criteria. So the fifth and final role that I've focused on right now is how to bring in the financing side to make these viable. These, these have to be viable entities to begin with, commercially viable entities, but then on top of that, how do we take them to the next levels? What do they need? What financing needs? What risk tools do they need? How do we uh, program the covenants? What insurance can be brought in? There are, there are so many factors it's impossible to talk about right now. But the fact is cash flow at the end of the day is king. Uh, investors want returns and they want progress. So we try to move everything into a combination of blended finance, how to scale up, classic business things but obviously keeping those blue um, criteria, the metrics uh, in focus. And I think it's a very exciting thing that um, the Blue Impact uh, platform is providing. It actually aligns the vision, mission, and values of the blue economy with the commercial viability. And that will be very, very nice if it can be done, because it will be an example for many, many people. And it saves time because it brings together the curated players, experienced and proven partners who know their territories, they know their industry, they know their markets with the latest technology. The point is here to, is to modernize, not just to reinvent an old wheel, but to really do step changes and scale up. So since investors and SMEs have specified interests and needs, the Blue Impact platform is an important link for the blue economy by letting SMEs and investors find each other in an efficient, transparent, and timely manner, basically facilitating stakeholder engagement at many, many different levels. Um, and I, I guess I'll stop there because we have short time, but I think those are some of the key points of the Blue Impact uh, platform that frankly, in my opinion, are a fantastic advance. Well, thank you very much, uh, Joanne, for this uh, pertinent uh, considerations. And uh, 
shortly turn to a panel of investors to, to get their perspective and see you know, whether you know, they concur, they feel comfortable, and uh, you know, they have perhaps other concerns. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we would like again to play two videos that illustrate uh, there are in fact uh, very bankable SME projects out there in, in, in the Asian region. So um, the first video, we would like to showcase a project in the seaweed sector that is supported by blockchain technology. I won't say more at this stage. Let's just watch this video and then I will comment uh, quickly as well. Asia Affinity is a holding company based in Hong Kong with a solid track record of building, enabling and protecting community engaged environmental impact SMEs in the region. Its two subsidiaries, Sea Green and Mary Oceans, work across Southeast Asia, providing digital infrastructure and governance support respectively to coastal communities. This combined strategy serves to maximize impact and accelerate scale across the blue economy. Mary Oceans currently operates in South Sulawesi, Indonesia, where seaweed farming has been established for decades, but during which time little has changed in the sector. The organization leverages cooperative structuring to improve output quality and empower financial resilience in a cyclical model ensuring that profit is reinvested into the community. Injecting capital supports the implementation of new practices from quality seed stock management through selection and monitoring of growing sites to optimization of improved primary processing methodologies. By enabling transparency, connectivity and restorative practices, seaweed farmers become part of an equitable circular economy allowing them to transition from artisanal farming to contracted large-scale operations. By 2026, Mary aims to produce over 150,000 tonnes of fresh seaweed per year and generate revenues in excess of $40 million annually. The Sea Green mobile app supports farmers' aggregation of detailed environmental, commercial and traceability data, creating a blockchain-based digital twin of the value chain. Platform infrastructure and APIs make this data available to stakeholders across the supply chain and for the development of new research, processes and services. This includes not only productivity and logistical optimization, but also financial services like loans and insurance. The organization works to ensure that this new value is democratically connected to the participants who need it, from farmers to buyers. With the mobile app free to download, the solution's front-end services are easily accessible to those who need them most. In turn, a low, transparent fee for buyers and access to a range of data tools ensures utility for downstream actors, whatever their motivation. Within five years, Seagrim will operate across territories and continents, supporting close to 25,000 users and generating over $13 million in revenue each year. Seagreen and Mary Ocean's combined solution serves to rebalance the fragmented seaweed value chain and unlock the vast potential of the sector. Optimizing the links between all actors in the supply chain and enhancing the value of each step in the seaweed production cycle underscores the key value at the heart of our model, collaboration. Enabling the environment for innovation and market development to thrive ensures fairer distribution of the predicted economic growth of the sector, projected to flourish alongside ever-increasing global demand for macroalgae as a commodity. Global recognition of seaweed farming as a sustainable livelihood for coastal communities is growing, with a unique power to transcend the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Building social foundations by promoting gender equality, household resilience and diversified income, Seagreen and Mary Ocean seek to work alongside coastal communities to foster sustainable growth. With its vast ecosystem benefits when managed effectively, seaweed cultivation can also restore biodiversity, improve water quality and has proven ability to contribute to climate mitigation through carbon drawdown. Beyond its immediate environmental impact, seaweed farming, when made a component of an integrated coastal management approach, can be a catalyst for community development. Building this holistic approach within the Asia Affinity Group allows for further expansion of connected services, including training and digital education, waste management solutions and microfinance, further driving coastal community development and opening avenues for new initiatives such as parametric insurance and disaster risk management.
well, this video, as all the other, by the way, you know, has been put together especially for uh, our spotlight session. So I would like uh, to express my greatest thanks to Graham Clark, who is the Executive Chief Officer of Asia Affinity with the two subsidiaries, Mari Oceans and Sea Greens, you just um, had the video about. He is uh, here together live with Fred Packel, the Chief Operation Officer of Sea Green, developing the digital mobile uh, application. I sincerely hope that we will have some time during the Q&A section um, to invite you for some, some more comments. The next video uh, showcases a P2P SME lending platform that will be presented by Ka Meng Wong, Chief Executive Officer of Funding Society. Please launch uh, the video. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, many thanks to the ABB team for inviting us to this panel forum discussion to talk about financing small and medium enterprises within the blue economy. On this during this panel discussion, um, I would like to share some financing challenges facing SMEs as well as how funding societies fits within the picture to help alleviate some of these challenges. So first and foremost, SMEs require access to appropriate sources of financing for the establishment, survival and growth across all stages of their life cycle. Although the access to bank finance has improved over the years, some structural limitations, including strict collateral requirements, high transaction costs, lengthy processes and lack of financial education or awareness continue to be major hindrances to SMEs in getting their financing support. In addition, SMEs seeking to undertake sustainable economy activities, including green and blue economy, face additional barriers to fund these activities. Some of the supply side uh, challenges that they face include information asymmetries between lenders and SMEs, a limited range of suitable financing products adapted to the needs of these particular SMEs and the potentially niche nature of the sustainable economy, which results in incompatibility of lenders and entrepreneurs' ideals and objectives. On the demand side, SMEs often lack awareness and investor readiness for sustainable financial opportunities and may not have the capabilities to meet the reporting criteria that financial institutions require for sustainable financing. On our end, how funding societies fits into the picture as the leading SME digital financing platform in Southeast Asia is that we connect these underbanked but creditworthy SMEs with lenders via a digital platform. And these lenders comprise retail, high net worth and institutional investors, including government, multilateral agencies, impact funds, and the like. We offer the widest range of financing products to meet the most SMEs needs across different sizes, industries, and vintages. We're happy to have successfully, successfully dispersed more than $2 billion in financing, empowering more than 100,000 deserving SMEs across the region. Through our proprietary credit assessment process, we enable seamless application procedure for SMEs, thereby reducing the documentation requirements and to speed up their turnaround times. To this end, we are encouraged by the catalytic funding initiatives by the Asian Development Bank in mobilizing more private capital to support SMEs in the sustainable economy. In addition, we believe the technical assistance from the ADB and its role in fostering ongoing dialogue and engagement between public and private investors, different SME associations and international organizations will further ease barriers to sustainable financing for SMEs. Lastly, uh, looking forward, really looking forward to how this conversation on supporting the financing uh, of SMEs in the blue economy proceeds into the future, and really looking forward to see how funding studies can play a role in supporting SMEs in this economy. Thank you. Many, many thanks, uh, Carmen. Uh, funding society's track record is definitely uh, very impressive. And uh, we cannot only explore, uh, explore your business case uh, as an investment opportunity, uh, allowing you to, to leverage your expertise in the, in the blue economy, but, but uh, we may also consider a collaboration with funding society as a, as a fund manager for SME Blue Back uh, Asia. So I guess, um, uh, um, Kameng is uh, with us, and uh, so he will also be available for the Q&A session. I would encourage you to continuously 
um, post your, your question. Uh, I would also uh, like to say that we have uh, Klaus Schulz uh, um, with us today. From uh, He is the policy offer of Blue Growth at the European Commission. Um, so he's one of the senior manager of Blue Invest uh, Europe since uh, the inception. And uh, he also will be available for Q&A at the end of this uh, session. Um, but this brings me, uh, we are a little bit lagging behind, um, it brings me to the next uh, section uh, of this session, uh, for which I would like to hand over to, to Michael for a panel uh, providing perspective uh, from the investors. So the floor is yours for the next uh, 20 minutes, Michael. Thank you, Thomas. And thank you uh, again to all who are participating here. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Georges Buchering. This will be by video, who is director and co-creator of Climate Fund Managers. They're a, a $1.5 billion uh, under management, a blended finance manager from the Netherlands. And um, importantly for us, they also run the blue economy and climate uh, assets for FMO, the Dutch uh, Development Finance Institution. Uh, would you please start the video? If that's trouble, I will, okay. Uh, the scent, well, let's move on and try to solve that problem uh, later then. Okay, uh, moving on. Um, we also have another asset manager who is um, uh, one of the top impact investment fund managers. This is Symbiotics Group. And Eugene Tan is the regional manager for East Asia and the Pacific for Symbiotics Group. He's building out the private debt team um, in the region. And uh, we'll be really pleased to hear their view on uh, SME investing, which they apparently are increasing steadily. Please, uh, Eugene. All right, uh, thanks, Michael. And it's really a pleasure to be here. All right, uh, this, uh, thanks for the opportunity really for us to give an uh, introduction to Symbiotics and what we're doing. Uh, to help SMEs flourish. Now, Symbiotics is an impact investment specialist uh, that has been financing the MSMEs enterprises segment in emerging and frontier markets for well over 16 years. And we do this primarily through private debt placements with financial institutions that focus really on the SME segment. And as Michael pointed out, you know, today uh, I'll say the bulk of our investments are really targeted towards the MSME thematic. Uh, and we work with well over 300 financial institutions and companies in that segment. Now, given the central role that SMEs play in their economies, uh, we find that we believe that they are a perfect way to also address today's climate change issues. Uh, SMEs are very often also at the forefront of innovation, and we believe they can bring drastic changes in the way we are operating businesses and help address these global warming issues. Now for us at Symbiotics, uh, we also have been you know, moving along with investor demand and what we see as critical uh, challenges in climate change by launching our own Green Bond framework in line with ICMA principles. And through this framework, uh, we have been actively issuing green social and sustainable bonds for financial institutions, financing green assets or directly into SMEs whose products are eligible under the Green Bond framework. So far, we have done uh, quite a number, and particularly in the renewable energy space. But we are very excited to actually move this to other areas addressing climate change and other pressing environmental problems. We strongly believe that the blue economy and SMEs active in sector will play a vital role in addressing SDG 14 and are committed to pursue and grow our SME lending portfolio with particular focus on projects in this area. Now, just a brief word uh, on uh, as an investor perspective. Uh, we're always on the lookout for eligible and qualified transactions, right? Uh, that would you know, fit into the social mandate of what our investors want. Now, during the past two years of this pandemic, however, we often find ourselves with strong funding inflows, but often not enough deal flow to absorb that liquidity. So, you know, we are hence very excited with the launch of Blue Impact since it will be very helpful for our generations to help us filter and source the relevant deals in the blue economy segment. Let's have a share. Oh. 
All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eugene. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce Marissa Drew, Chief Sustainability Officer of Credit Suisse. Uh, so Marissa is responsible for setting the strategy to promote sustainable finance and impact investing on behalf of the bank's private wealth clients, as well as institutional and corporate clients. It's quite a big role. She's a, a real leader in the whole field of sustainability. And uh, we're delighted to hear her perspective on, on the subject today. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you very much, Michael, and it's a, a real pleasure to be here. And um, I certainly applaud uh, my partners here for uh, for this initiative. At, at Credit Suisse, one of the early on when I was getting involved in in SDG 14 work, um, we started to map the UN Sustainable Development Goals to try to understand where private capital was flowing. And the big shock that we uncovered when we did this work was that SDG 14 was the second least invested of all the UN SDGs from a private capital point of view. Given how absolutely critical the oceans are to planetary and human health, it was a real surprise to us to, uh, to find that fact. And um, then that set us uh, down a little bit of a journey, I would say, to, uh, to try to understand why that was the case. And um, this uh, culminated in a survey that we did with the world's largest institutional asset managers, uh, those running very large pools of capital, uh, where we asked them, uh, were, do you think oceans are fundamentally investable from an institutional point of view? And if the answer to that is yes, are you invested in the oceans? And if the answer to that is no, then why not? And um, the net sum of that work um, really resulted, it's more nuanced than this, but the, the short answer is that there were not enough projects for these pools of capital to find that spoke to their needs. And so we said, well, that is something that we can ho hope to try to correct. And we've now spent the last several years on a process to try to correct that. But um, what, what exactly was it that they say that they need? And this is exactly, interestingly, what the platform is designed to do. So number one, uh, the investors were telling us that uh, they need an easy way to identify projects. I mean, Eugene just said it. It was sort of find, show us the pipeline of what's out there. And I think whether you're institutional or whether you're a private client, you need some way to filter and sift and be able to identify those projects that matter to you. We tend to find with private wealth clients they are very keen to invest in the oceans, but they also um, are, are, it's somewhat of an emotional decision. And uh, what they can identify with are projects in their regions. Uh, so they tend to like to invest closer to home. And so if you have this platform and you can filter and say, I live here and I would like to fund a project somewhere in my geography, that is, is great. Otherwise, they feel like it's somewhat, you know, of a, of a little bit of Russian roulette of, of trying to find projects. The second thing that they want is some sort of a vetting process. They, of course, have a fiduciary responsibility if they're institutional, but also personally, uh, to make sure that they do their own due diligence, but a pre-screening of those that meet certain thresholds. And I think it's wonderful that um, you know these projects uh, will go through some sort of a process and aren't ready to put in, be put in front of investors until they've met certain hurdles. That makes it easier on everybody because nobody wants to waste their time. And of course, you want to make sure that the projects and investments are ready, but you also want to appeal to those investors who are time starved. And then the final thing is just help with the process itself. Uh, a lot of these, particularly if you're talking about individuals, private family offices, they don't have huge infrastructure to do all of the detailed legal work and process work. And if we can make it easy somehow and standardize around certain uh, basic fundamental principles, once again, we're making it easy. So um, this is what this platform is designed to do. I think it is very much in the camp of meeting that gap of what investors are looking for uh, with their capital and uh, very much looking forward to supporting the process. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, Marissa. Excellent uh, background and endorsement again, um, and very important for us to have your perspective on this. It's my pleasure now also to introduce Samir Narula, who is Managing Director of August One, which is a multifamily office and fund manager regulated in Singapore, but active worldwide. Uh, Samir is an engineer by training. He spent his uh, professional career helping SMEs uh, unlock their potential using sustainability and technology themes. 
Uh, he founded the One Blue uh, Fund and Accelerator in Singapore, which is involved in all the maritime sectors. And he currently heads August One's growing European operations. We've been in conversation with Samir and his team for the last year. And it's my pleasure now to hand over to him some comments. Thanks, Samir. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and uh, thank you, Thomas, as well, for uh, inviting me to be a part of this. Um, and uh, I just uh, I wanted to also mention that all the speakers, previous speakers have been very, very clear on the importance of water and the importance of the oceans as a lifeblood for our species. And I think uh, from my perspective, I think there's also a very strong economic, cultural and social connection that we have, uh, especially between Europe and Asia, uh, as we look back beyond the centuries of how the oceans have connected us. And at August 1, we're a private investment firm, as you mentioned. Um, uh, One Blue is our accelerator, which uh, was originally founded as Port Excel, uh, Port Excel Singapore. It was Port Excel's business in Asia that we took over a few years ago and um, adapted it to the needs of uh, emerging markets and to Asia. We are supported by the government of Singapore through uh, Enterprise Singapore. We also now have a fund called Atlantico with the Portuguese government, which is focused on the Azores and Madeira, which are the two largest, uh, which is the largest ocean, uh, economic exclusion zone in the Atlantic Ocean. We're um, we're very um, we're very very uh, excited about the new platform that you're launching, actually, because uh, we've seen that there is a uh, tremendous amount of energy that's been uh, unlocked within the SME sectors uh, within Asia and Europe. Uh, and this is fueled a lot by technology, but also uh, by an understanding of the need that we uh, we need to work with SMEs to to uh, um, to solve some of the problems that we're facing. And with interest rates rising and emerging markets becoming a bit challenging for investors around the world, any help that we can provide SMEs uh, to come to the fore and get funded would be uh, really valuable. So not to take too much time, but just to uh, to mention a little bit that the areas of interest for us include. Uh, from a uh, marine perspective, coastal resilience, alternative food sources are very important to us, um, uh, carbon negative and carbon neutral transportation and energy. And the way we look at these companies is uh, through companies that are using material science, automation and robotics um, and other technologies, but also very importantly, we're starting to look at blue carbon projects. So these are projects that link the new financial uh, system that's emerging with crypto and with blockchain and uh, linking it to carbon sequestration and, and looking at it from uh, science-based targets. So our, our next fund, which we are looking to launch uh, in the Nordic through Finland, which Michael, I know you are aware of as well, that we're working with, uh, with, uh, with the Nordic government, uh, hopes to connect Europe and Asia more and more, since SMEs now are liberated to a certain extent in terms of how they collaborate and who they work with. So that's a little bit about us and a little bit about what we do. Uh, happy to answer any questions. And thanks again uh, to the ADB and uh, Ocean Assets for inviting us. Thank you, Samir. All right, it's my um, pleasure to introduce Jonathan Gilman. I mean, really is a pleasure because Jonathan's been a core part of the team for the last year and a half from UNEP. Um, and his career, uh, he's an economist by training, but has done such a wide range of things that's difficult to summarize in one, in one sentence, so I won't try, but John, Jonathan has been active in a range of activities for various UN agencies across the Asia-Pacific region for all those uh, years, and uh, has been instrumental in guiding forward the um, Blue Economy Knowledge Product and now Blue Impact Platform and making sure it's aligned with the uh, sustainability um, goals and metrics of uh, the various UN initiatives, especially the UN Environment Program. Uh, Jonathan, please, um, I, I think you're going to help us put all this in context with what we need from uh, policy makers to uh, help to help support this drive towards SME financing. Yes, thank you, Michael. Uh, I, I want to make a couple of points about the role of government in this uh, work that we're talking about today. Uh, the first point is that Working for the UN and the region, what we are seeing is a, a, an accelerating demand for support on financing a blue economy. We're working in, in Fiji on uh, a new project with partners trying to mobilize additional private and public investments for their coral reef areas. We're working with Bangladesh to uh, help mobilize investments for SMEs in the ecotourism and small scale fisheries sector. Uh, and we'll be doing that by kickstarting a discussion, uh, a national dialogue on blue bonds and the feasibility of, of uh, blue bonds there. Uh, we're working with Indonesia as well on uh, developing a blue economy financing framework. Uh, and I think the uh, a key point in terms of the role of government are these national blue economy frameworks or, or roadmaps. 
uh, and where we see these as key to helping to uh, enable private uh, investment in a blue economy. Now, these these roadmaps can can uh, take uh, different forms, but UNDP and, and UNEP are focused on working with governments to firstly map, uh, assess, and value a country's marine and coastal ecosystems, so that we know uh, which are the areas for a priority investment. We're also looking at what sort of reviewing government regulations that can support uh, a blue economy, for example, providing incentives to SMEs to adopt clean technologies, new technologies, phase out uh, environmentally harmful technologies, uh, and uh, ensuring waste management regulations and guidance are in place, for example, uh, in local governments uh, around coastal areas. We also, these frameworks can also uh, look at government's role in mobilizing public finance to leverage private finance, whether through public-private partnerships, blended finance mechanisms such as uh, Blue Impact Asia, uh, and also accessing some of the global uh, climate funds that are available to help support that. Uh, the, the last point I wanted to say as well, within these frameworks, a key aspect is, is uh, for SDG 14 is, is measurement. Marissa earlier on mentioned that uh, SDG 14 has the least uh, amount of investment of all the SDGs, but it's also, I'd say, the least measured. Of the 10 SDG indicators for SDG 14 on oceans, only three are currently measurable in the region. So there's an urgent need, I think, for governments and development partners to work together to increase the capacity at the national level to measure progress of, the, uh, of SDG 14 so that we can really quantify exactly and, and become aware and, and increase awareness of the impact of uh, investment mechanisms such as Blue Impact Asia. So those are just some of the, the, the highlights from the UNDP and UNEP's perspective on uh, the government engagement side of things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, I don't believe we have time for questions right now. Perhaps we will at the very end, but just to make sure we have adequate time for the closing remarks and uh, perhaps final q and I'll pass it back to Thomas. Well, uh, actually, um, Michael, I think we can play George's video, which we have recovered. And I think it would be uh, a very valuable additional uh, investor's voice. So if you would like uh, to quickly introduce him and let's play the video as well. Great, okay. Uh, as I mentioned previously, George Buchering is a co-creator of Climate Fund Managers running $1.5 billion in assets in blended finance um, strategies for among other things, FMO uh, and including some of their blue economy investments. Uh, you're running the video, Thomas? Our last technique. Hi everyone, good day. I'm very pleased to be part of this SME Blue Impact Asia community and keen to make a contribution. My name is George Buckering. I'm director um, for capital raising and business development at Climate Fund Managers, uh, a climate focused fund manager based in the Netherlands. We focus on bringing blended finance to emerging markets and have recently included the blue economy into our investment strategy. And the reasons are obvious. The oceans provide half of the world's oxygen. They also feed 3 billion people and have absorbed 93% of the added heat from human driven changes to the atmosphere. But as important as they are to humans and the planet, they are in a threat. Uncontrolled pollution, rising temperatures, consistent over exploitation, invasive species. The list grows larger and the consequences more severe with each passing year. And the oceans are already feeding the effects of these problems. They've absorbed the climate's excess heat and now sit at record temperatures. So establishing a blue economy at scale is going to be a key driver of sustainable long-term global development. To recognize the importance of the blue economy in our work, climate fund managers recently became a signatory of the United Nations backed sustainable blue economy finance principles. For us, signing this really represents a long-term commitment to the transition towards sustainable use of the world's ocean, sea, and marine resources. 
the timing of our signature follows the launch of our Climate Investor 2 facility. We have really designed Climate Investor 2 around the idea of bringing scale and focus to sustainable water, sanitation and oceans infrastructure projects in emerging markets. To generate that scale, Climate Investor 2 uses blended finance, which uses donor funding to catalyze commercial capital. During November 2021, CI2 reached a first close of $675 million. And this put us on the right path towards reaching our final target of a billion dollars. At this scale, CI2 is forecast to catalyze an additional two and a half billion dollars in private sector funds. The projects supported by CI2 are also forecast to treat five and a half billion liters of water and wastewater per day, providing around 14 million people with safe drinking water and around 4 million people with sanitation services. We anticipated that CI2 will restore 75,000 hectares of wetland and coastal ecosystems, whilst also helping to avoid the release of 3.5 million tons of CO2 per year. The projects Climate Investor 2 supports are already finding innovative ways to generate this impact. These are projects which will remove invasive species from ships' ballast water, reduce carbon intensity of global shipping, and even expand the Galapagos Marine Reserve in Ecuador through a debt for nature swap. We're really excited about the precedent Climate Investor 2 will set, and we'll look forward to promoting the importance of the sustainable blue economy. Thank you very much, and we we'll wish you all the best of luck, and hope to meet you soon in person. Thank you. Thank you very much, George, and climate fund managers for playing such a critical role. Um, I will pass this back to Thomas with thanks again for the whole panel and um, hope that we can have some Q&A time in a minute. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Michael and, and all the panel. I think uh, this is really the start of uh, a discussion which could go uh, on very, very much longer. Um, but we would like actually uh, just um, to pick up uh, at least one question which uh, came in um, and which um, you know goes a little bit into, well, how this can be really scaled up. Um, in the sense, um, we have shown some of the, the, the metrics, but of course the gap is, is huge and needs, needs much more. So perhaps I could invite uh, Graham shortly just to give us uh, his perspective on, um, you know, you have presented your initiative in Indonesia on sea green and, um, and, and the seaweed. And so I would like actually to ask you whether you have already some intentions and some views, how this could be scaled up in, in other countries um, in, in Asia. So may I invite you to make a short comment? Thomas, well, thank you. And thank you very much for inviting us what's been a fascinating afternoon. Um, yes, I think this is the scalability and sustainability of the model was a key building block. For us. When we did the initial evaluation, we spent a year looking at the end-to-end -end value chain um, and really what was the, the advantage and the issue and the interest of every actor within that chain. Um, from that, we developed the two elements of the model. One was the, the, the cooperative, the grassroots level, which was going to allow, allow the farmers both to farm more efficiently and importantly to scale, but around that, was to be able to provide the other bits of the magic that was going to make it look sustainable. So the access to finance, uh, the education, uh, job training, financial inclusion, communication, all those bits that would enable the model to be sustainable. Sea Green, as the ecosystem platform, provides the infrastructure. That provides the wraparound, the ability to track and trace every single, single step, change of state and ownership throughout the whole chain and all the environmental data. Now, the reason for being able to make the investment in that way and being able to build it like that was exactly so we could scale it. A, from at the growing level, from artisanal to large scale, we're working on 50 hectare blocks. This becomes really interesting when you're taking communities and you're doing it at 250, 500 hectares and you're getting scale in the operation. Then you're making big impact, not only on the community, but also on the output. 
Secondly, was the environmental data that you were able to generate from, from the platform itself. And I think the, for us, a big driver, which comes right the way back to this group this afternoon, was as we are able to demonstrate trans, you know, um, transparency on the growing, then hopefully we're also adding the third element to the scalability issue, which is the transparency for the provision of liquidity. At the moment, you cannot get liquidity. No one funds growing seaweed. But with the technology that's available, this becomes now an option. You can show with transparency what's actually happening at the farm at the primary end. So I think these were some of the things that enabled us to think about, do we want to scale it? Absolutely. Is it scalable in Asia? Yes. Is it global? Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, uh, Graham. Uh, we look really forward to, to take that further. Um, now, actually, we, we are coming to, you know, um, the end of this session. Um, there, will, there are some more questions. We will look at them and we will respond to them on a, on a written basis uh, in, in our uh, session summary. But um, in view of the time, I would like, um, you know, to um, hand over to Dr. Jung Lee for the closing remarks. Uh, Jung Kyu Lee is uh, ADV's chief of financial sector group at the ADV. He is an economist of uh, seasoned policy making um, experience amongst else uh, based on his um, work at, as a G20 special advisor and international economic advisor to the finance minister of Republic of Korea. So thanking everyone, I would like to pass over to uh, Jung Kyu for the closing remark. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, we have had a very interesting spotlight session with lots of valuable insight, perspective, knowledge on the challenges and opportunities, uh, especially related to the SDG 14, and particularly focused on SME Blue Impact Asia platform. Uh, we observed that the SME Blue Impact Asia is also fully aligned with the G20 agenda and priorities and proposed by the Sustainable Finance Working Group under the Indonesia G20 Presidency. Uh, ADB is actively supporting the development of SME financing product through an integrated blended finance approach, including uh, credit guarantee scheme, uh, government SME lending scheme and credit insurance schemes. SME Blue Impact Asia will be an essential component in this endeavor. And as, it will, as it'll operate uh, using an innovative digital platform that will help SMEs facing challenges in accessing finance, uh, it'll focus on the generation of the blue SME pipelines and ensure SME investment readiness and support SME investment deal aggregation. And the platform will include a blended finance toolkit that combines various financial instruments to de-risk portfolios of SMEs and the investment and so attract private sector financing. Development partners will provide catalytic uh, funding and consider credit guarantees and first loss protections to crowd in private investors. Sovereign loans and or SME finance bond issuance can complement the funding of the platform. Blue SMEs will be able to tap into the available funding, mainly through equity and loans and a range of other innovative financial services, including insurance products. We appreciate the European Commission's effort to offer to uh, uh, leverage their experience made with Blue Invest Europe. This is really the great lesson to us. And UN Secretary General Special Envoy for the Ocean Ambassador Peter Thompson requested an urgent and ambitious rollout, and we are happy to answer his request to report preliminary research and during the second UN Ocean, Ocean Conference in Lisbon. Uh, I think it's coming 27th June to uh, 1st July 2022 this year. Taking this opportunity, I'd like to thank our colleagues from especially UNEP and UNDP for their excellent cooperation. This is very excellent cooperation uh, for all of us and seeking significant improvement in poverty reduction, gender equality, as well as positive environmental impact. I also like to express my sincere gratitude to all panelists and special thanks should go to ADB Environment TG Group also uh, because they provided us this wonderful opportunity for presenting and engaging us with SME Blue Impact Asia. And before we end the day, 
Uh, I'd like to turn your turn you over to our ADB colleagues for some closing words of day two and provide you with a short outlook on tomorrow's program. Thank you so very much. Hi everyone, it's been another fantastic day here at the ADB Healthy Oceans Tech and Finance Forum. And once again, I would like to extend our gratitude to all our partners, speakers, and participants who joined us today. I'm Anna Posa and I am your MC. To close day two, I'm here again with Cheng Feng Zhang. He was with me also yesterday. He is the chief of the Rural Development and Food Security Thematic Group and also the OIC of the Environment Thematic Group at ADB. Hi, Cheng Feng. So what did you think of the program today? Yeah, thank you so much. And again, I, I learned so much from today's discussion. I, I feel very inspired by, by the program today. Uh, we have so many amazing speakers who are working uh, to push forward innovative uh, solutions for Asia Pacific. Uh, probably uh, let me start with the, the one and after mm -hmm. today, they are uh, the kind of launch of the new SMEs uh, through uh, Impact Asia facility. Uh, you know, as you, 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 you know, this is not an easy topic. SME, mm. of course, very critical. Uh, they are needing innovative solutions to deliver their both uh, ocean and economic benefits. But sometimes, uh, accessing their stable uh, financing always challenging them, uh, always challenging for them to achieve their, their ambitions. So I, I saw this as a new uh, initiative launch today, very, very critical to help address this uh, persistence issue. And uh, mm -hmm. will help us uh, scale up uh, investment uh, in an uh, uh, ocean health uh, area. At the same time, we also had a spotlight uh, from uh, one station from the WWF on uh, mm -hmm. community-based solutions for nature and also ocean health. Uh, it is a great, we can see uh, initiatives targeting uh, solutions uh, under the ground level. Of course, we still have the many others, but uh, let me just mm -hmm. pause here, uh, Anna. Yeah, that was a great session, the one with WWF. And it shows us that communities and small businesses offer uh, often suffer from the most, um, from, they have the most impact. So they feel climate change, overfishing, marine plastics, and more. But the sessions, they highlighted that communities and small businesses are also a huge part of the solution. You are right. Actually, the, uh, you, you know, I, I am also in charge of the rural development food system. Uh, and of course, we always say the, uh, the uh, brew food is mm -hmm. an emerging area. As we, 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 we discussed in the brew food session today, uh, brew aquatic, uh, aquatic food system where create opportunities for the women and also small uh, scale uh, actors and mm -hmm. the person area. Uh, of course, we also heard from the panelists uh, today, it is very important uh, that uh, women are supported and empowered uh, in the sustainable seafood sector. Mm -hmm. Again, for the food system, uh, sustainable food system, uh, one of the key lessons is uh, uh, take an inclusive approach. So uh, uh, we can hear from today two key points. One is a social inclusion is a key to improve mm -hmm. their waste management systems, which can reduce their positive waste uh, in our oceans. And sometimes uh, mm -hmm. social inclusion is also very important because it catalyzes creative energy that can mm -hmm. produce uh, some of the uh, most important innovative solutions to the society uh, uh, problems as well. Let me pause mm -hmm. here, Anna. Yeah, and you know, it's been said that the future is female, but I have to add that the future of fisheries is also female. One of the strong takeaways I had um, was from the from the seaside chat with the ministers this afternoon. And Minister Amina Shauna from the Maldives, and she's actually um, a woman who holds a key position in a small island developing state. And there's also Minister Ayaz Zayed Karim, and from Fiji, he's from Fiji. And both of them emphasize the need for community 
communities on the front lines um, dealing with all these ocean issues to be supported, engaged, and empowered to lead a revolution for healthy oceans. It was also underscored by the retired Honorable Lord Zach Goldsmith. He earlier spoke also about the critical role that oceans play in climate action, including the small island developing states. He also spoke about the United Kingdom's commitments to support ocean climate action in Asia, uh, Asia and the Pacific, our region, as a priority. You are right. Actually, I, I, I absolutely agree. Actually, the, uh, one of the richest uh, discussions today, of course, is this, this seaside uh, chair. Mm. And uh, mm -hmm. also, uh, we can see uh, the ocean program will uh, elevate to such a high level. Uh, and uh, during the session, you can see uh, Vice President um, uh, Sae say the ADB definitely we will continue to scale up uh, our investment and technical assistance to our mm -hmm. developing, uh, developing member countries. And uh, he also emphasized the need for an integrated approach to the ocean health uh, uh, program as well. Mm -hmm. We are also therefore grateful to our better uh, partners who understand the importance of the engaging, uh, you know, our uh, a, 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 a players in the uh, Asia and the Pacific regions. Uh, we are, mm -hmm. of course, uh, you know, the uh, Asian Pacific, uh, again, is going to be a, 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 the global uh, epicenter mm -hmm. of a, a marine, marine uh, biodiversity. Uh, yeah. uh, I was also struck uh, by the example of the good practices that, that, that can be uh, replicated mm -hmm. within uh, our region. And uh, of course, a uh, uh, replicate uh, to the other regions, such mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, the new blue sea finance hope hub. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is a new hub developed by the ASIN uh, Cadillac uh, Green Finance Facility in partnership with the, uh, with the government of the Indonesia. You can see uh, this is a very, very strong uh, ownership. Uh, we heard today from the uh, Mr. Ruha uh, Binsa uh, mm -hmm. Pajeta of the Indonesia. Uh, he emphasized the importance of uh, the new facility. He say, you know, this is where develop and fund the blue economy projects in Indonesia. And he hope uh, this type of initiative and the model can be also replicated to the mm -hmm. rest of their region as well. Let me pause here, Anna. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing all of your key takeaways. And we can't forget about the exciting launch by the SEN Catalytic Green Finance Facility of the new book, Financing the Ocean Back to Health in Southeast Asia, Approaches to Mainstreaming Blue Finance. As a bookworm, you can see my book's at the back. I'm really excited for this and to be able to go through this book. The launch of this book by ADB Vice President Ahmed Saeed is a milestone for this region. And it, I'm sure that this book will be the foundation of many new innovations in ocean finance to come. Yeah, you are right. Actually, the uh, last two days there was this tremendous, you know, the initiative and the passions from speaker and also the partners and the audiences. Uh, speaking of the things to come, I actually I cannot wait until the tomorrow anymore. Actually, the uh, tomorrow, of course, is the third and also the third day of the, the forum. Uh, you know, tomorrow uh, we will have the much more, I think, a more inspirational initiative. We will have the severe. Uh, exciting uh, spotlight sessions are uh, going to be hosted by our partners, including mm. uh, the uh, World Resource Institute, uh, the government of the Japan, and also the uh, Lecture Conservancy, uh, World Fish Center, and of course is the UK Center for Ecology and Hydrology. One of them are champions in ocean health program. Uh, let me pause here and I also hope, you know, this type of the program we are inspiring our uh, audiences in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you. Yeah, so we have more in store for you tomorrow. But first, before we have all those spotlight sessions tomorrow, we have something a little bit different. We have what we call a circular plastics economy clinic and involves a little something that we call a project play shop. I'll be moderating that one. And we hope to see everyone there at 9 a.m. sharp Manila time. And that takes us to the end of day two. Can you believe it? It's been two days already. Thank you again and see you tomorrow. We look forward and uh, good luck. Thank you.